I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first, my name is Joan Bienvenue. I'm director of the Applied Research Institute at UVA, and you are at Grounds on the Go, which is our uh, research series that we present here up at the park, just to have an opportunity for, for folks other than the folks on grounds to really get a, a good sense of what we do at UVA. And so our topics range every every time we do something different. And for those of you who've come before, you've seen sort of the breadth of, of topics that we talk about here. And um, we're always looking for suggestions too, if there's a topic that you're particularly interested in hearing about. And we have a researcher or um, that we can, we can put up here to talk about it. We're happy to do that. So if you have suggestions, throw them our way. But today, I'm very excited to have Travis Height, who is uh, program director for the Link Lab. He is um, <coughs> relatively new at UVA. He has a tech background, which we, we overlooked <laughs> for Trey's hire. Um, the Virginia Tech, I should be specific. The tech background's fine. The Virginia Tech part gets a little dicey. Um, Travis's background revolves around the intersection of emerging technology, business, policy, and people. Um, he's, most of his experience comes from across the federal government at the Department of Defense and Homeland Security, as well as with Congress. Um, he also has roots in small business as both an advisor and a member of many startups. Technology is always um, central to his work, and you'll see today a lot of that coming out in the presentation. He often finds himself as a role of bridge builder, translator, connecting engineering to business, researcher to policymaker, and futurist to the present day. And I think that's a really actually great description of Travis. He's, a, he's definitely a connector of people, and um, technology is sort of the space that he applies that in. But I think what you'll see today is the Link Lab is a perfect spot for him to be given the work that goes on there so with that awesome. thank you yeah all right well welcome everybody um so coming off of that i always joke if you've seen the movie office space where there's that moment where one of them gets really frustrated and kind of justifying his job he's like someone has to talk to the engineers that pretty much encompasses everything i've done in my entire career um and a lot of what's happening at link lab so so link lab is this this nugget of new thought happening at the university. Um, it, it's a research facility, and it's, well, it's a research group and a research facility. And the reason I emphasize that is because we have 34 faculty currently, about 220 grad students that have all gathered to study what we call cyber physical systems. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but what's key to that is we actually kind of drawn them out of their uh, academic buildings and we co-located them. And, and a brand new floor, uh, renovated the entire space to be kind of an open concept, a collaborative concept. And we brought them in so agnostic to their discipline. As long as you're researching and educating something in cyber physical systems, you're welcome to join the group. Um, what that means is we moved all of those engineers into one big space and they have new desks and new environments and um, you know, we're asking them to work in new ways and, and schedule their classes in new ways and even the Link Lab itself is a completely different business model that looks very different at the university. So all those are things we'll talk about today in addition to the research we're doing. I'm gonna start a little bit with just kind of saying why. You know, what, why is this the time to start thinking, okay, maybe we get faculty outside of their academic building? Why is now the time to start thinking about multidisciplinary research? Um, this came from our last all hands for UVA engineering. And I thought, you know, usually I'm not one to throw up strategic goals onto the first slide of a compelling talk, but it, it matters. And the reason it matters is because this is academia kind of changing its mind about things, which as much as I love the amount of individual and group innovation that happens institutionally, sometimes academia can, can drag a bit, but that's not happening right now. And that's why this is really exciting. So the goal is just to kind of uh, summarize what's happening here. I highlighted in orange, multidisciplinary research, goal number one with societal importance. So UVA Engineering's number one goal multi is supporting multidisciplinary research. Second one down, student experience. When I did my grad work at another technically inclined Virginia institution. I was in a deep, dark dungeon basement. No windows that I shared with other people. They basically had us kind of on shift work. It was crazy. We were trying to just introduce a different environment. So not only the space they're working in, but what they're exposed to is just something kind of new and profound. And then this diverse and engaged community, the idea, and this has been sort of the bedrock of the UVA engineer and the UVA student is that they're, they're more well-rounded, they're more prepared for what life is gonna actually throw at them, just not what is in a textbook that belongs to their discipline. And those are all things that we're trying to support. Um, I think one of the really interesting things is, you know, so when we think about what and why, technology is at this really interesting point 
it, it's very combinatorial in nature right now. And what I mean by that is, so it's not that we aren't making advances in different fields of science and tech, but we're seeing a large chunk of advancement happen when you start to crush all those together. When you start to think about, okay, don't develop a new subfield, develop that field that branches into one of your neighbors, one of the other disciplines. And so that really gets into that multidisciplinary research area. Um, and that just has to do with a lot of the underlying technologies that are being developed right now. When you talk about digital, digitalizing everything and, and communications and just the idea of the internet, um, that's just going to start to create these bridges that allow you to swap information back and forth and find these innovations that can be very opportunistic or you know, through pretty rigorous research. But it does come about because of the intersections of things, not because you're diving deeper. And the second part is um, kind of what the school is realizing right now that you'll see in these goals, um, really wanting to change how they do business. You know, as I'll show you in a moment, our space is 17,000 square feet of newly renovated space. They gutted the entire second floor of Olson Hall, if you've been on grounds. And they rebuilt it all in this new environment, and it's, and it's just for Link Lab residents. Um, you'll hear me talk a lot about residents just because when I quote that 34 faculty and 220 students, um, we actually don't have room to house all of them. We house about half of those. Uh, we sort of thought it would take about two years to fill out the space, to have these faculty come and join us, and have these students come and join us on this kind of new idea. It took about two weeks to fill this space. So we got the two part right. We missed on the units from the years to the weeks thing. Uh, so we're having a great growth problem. That's always a good issue to have is when you have too many people that want to take part in what you're doing. Um, but it is a lot because it is this new experience. You know, we're, we're providing them incentives to work with people in other fields and other disciplines. And even when the students and the faculty move in, we're not letting them all sit in their research groups together. We're making them mix it up. We're making the engineers talk to each other. Um, and it's fun. We'll talk a little bit about how we, how we tackle that. And then the last part of all this uh, has to do with the university itself. Um, you know, it's something that I knew about the university, but I didn't really come to appreciate until I got here. It's just being in an environment where you have other top tier schools and business and policy and commerce and education and architecture, law and medicine. Um, I actually originally had a whole page of just stats that were just like, oh man, everything UVA is doing is awesome. And it got to the point where it's like, hey, this is silly. You know, I, it's just too much. But almost every school is ranked top 10 nationally and internationally. Uh, and so to have that support for when you're researching all these technologies really goes back to that multidisciplinary idea. It's not just about multidisciplinary engineering. It's about starting to look at, okay, what are the business impacts of what we're trying to build? What policies need to be in place to make sure that these technologies can really have the impact we're meaning? Um, how are we going to affect jobs in local economies? You know, we get into architecture because we do a ton with smart buildings and smart environments. And you know, the design of those spaces is something really compelling, including the open concept, which has kind of pros and cons. Uh, we work very deeply with medicine, which I actually brought a couple little things to show off today. So having all these different schools within walking distance is something that's very, very unique to, to Link Lab and to UVA Engineering. So when you think about the what and the why, it's the timing's right because of what's happening in science and tech. The timing is right because what UVA is trying to do with itself, specifically UVA Engineering. And then third, just location. You can't ignore the quality and all these other fields around you and how you should be working with them, and we are. So, oh yeah. so one of these um, slides right here, this, this is our spot. Uh, this is our home. This is where we do all of our business. For about the first six months, they didn't let me leave this floor, kind of operating as move-in attendant, um, construction management. It was an interesting time. I love this visual because this is actually a product of one of our research groups. You'll see all these little circles. I've got a, a video later that shows you this was actually created by running a small autonomous drone through our space with a LiDAR sensor on it. And they just map the entire space. Uh, and it works out to be this gorgeous uh, background that you see here. We do have lab in our name. We do have some lab space. But it is mostly about that co-location. So these big areas in the corners are where the students come together. These offices on the outside are faculty. Those are all glass front offices. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. We have a big kind of common area in the middle. And then this little corner over here is, is our dedicated lab space. When the faculty came to join Link Lab, they gave up all of their space in the other academic buildings except for their labs. So our lab space operates a little bit like a, a startup zone. If you have students that have a new idea or they just got a new grant 
or they just need a table to work out something for their dissertation. We have all that space and we can provide that to them. We can book it for weeks, months, terms, a year or two if it needs be. And if it grows to something, then we help move them into the larger facilities. So this is sort of like a little startup incubation space. Uh, it's been really effective in helping people really go from the desks and the team rooms and the whole design of the space to just ride into this lab to kind of test out what they want or to, to gain some new space. Uh, one of my favorite stories is I had undergrads that are uh, affiliated with our group, even though we're all mostly grad students. They came in and they asked me for a couple desks because they really want to just hook up a bunch of Raspberry Pis, create a blockchain, and do some research for about two or three weeks. And that's really just the embodiment of exactly what we want that space to be. It doesn't have to be this long legacy project. It doesn't have to be something with dedicated space and resources. You can just pop in. You're not doing it at home. Uh, I have so many students that have said they've moved their research projects from their living room in their apartment into our lab. Um, and it really is that just streamless facilitation of the collaboration into ideas into space. Now, the one thing to, to say is we aren't the only crosscut. Uh, and by cross-cut, I mean this kind of multidisciplinary idea. The school really wanted to come at, in our particular situation, uh, with, with two experiments in mind. One was the design of that space uh, to really try out what does it mean to introduce this cohort into a collaborative environment that you do see in industry, uh, but is very new here. And then the second is what happens when we bring the faculty together to do multidisciplinary research. And the impacts of that are interesting when you start to think about you have faculty that were hired into our lab that are dual appointed to two different, um, two different departments. What does that mean for their research requirements, for their teaching requirements? What does that mean for their tenure? All of a sudden, they're separated from all of the faculty that vote them in for tenure. So there's been a lot of just kind of the, the, the grind and the, the gears behind how a university works that we've had to alter a little bit. Um, so it is really much an experiment in that business model as it is in the research group, as it is in the space itself. And so far, this have gone extremely well. We find ourselves bringing in a really good amount of grant money um, that the, the slope is going up. We haven't been together for that long. We, we got together in January is when uh, the floor opened up. Uh, but we're already showing about a 50% increase in grants just in our first year. Uh, and they're almost all multidisciplinary in nature, which is kind of the goal. Um, but the other part is just that we're seeing an impact on how the students work together and how those ideas get generated. So it's less and less about a faculty member has this idea and everyone goes to work on it or they get a specific grant. You see a lot of people start to, to pick and choose what, what's the fruit they want to kind of tackle. What do they want to pull off that tree? And then they go out to search funding. So you see sort of an aggressiveness come around, which is nice. Um, but as far as the crosscuts go, so that's our model. There are three other crosscuts. There's one called Engineering and Medicine, uh, and they're a collaboration between the School of Medicine and UV Engineering to provide seed grants to research groups that cross those two boundaries. So they don't have a big facility, they don't have a research group, they're a seed grant uh, group. There's the, I always mess this one up, the Multifunctional Materials Integration Group, uh, where they come together to look at really interesting environments to introduce materials, new materials, and to design new materials. Uh, when you think about, I want to put something in space, or I want to drop something in a volcano, or what's really interesting, I want to put something in the human body. Those are all extremely difficult environments to design a sensor, to, to have materials that won't either set off the body's immune system, or won't you know, succumb to the radiation you find in space, or the stress of the, the launch. So that's their field, and they work very tightly there. And then the last is um, a, a unit that's kind of coming together around some new ideas in, in cybersecurity. And it's new enough where I won't pretend to understand what they're doing yet. But for us, in cyber physical systems, um, we have three research pillars. So smart cities, and that's pretty much an embodiment of the, the Internet of Things, which I'm sure uh, you've heard a little bit about. Uh, but if not, it's essentially the idea that we're creating so many sensors that we put out into the world um, that you're, you're going to have eventually trillions of endpoints that are collecting data uh, around the globe. And I think trillions is supposed to be around 2035 or so is the projection. But as of last year, we've officially gotten past there are more devices on the Internet of Things than there are people on the globe. So that's a really interesting point because we're turning where instead of a device being owned by a person, I have a phone, I have a computer. 
we're getting to the point where spaces own those devices or environments own those devices or different, you know, so it's not people centric anymore. It's becomes both the built and the natural environment where your sensor systems are centric there. And that's what smart cities for us means. It's, it's about the environment. It's about society. It's kind of understanding how a group works and how a group comes together. Um, it's not just about the city. We actually do a lot of rural work as well to understand how we can look at dynamics um, to, to be outside of just the, the, the nomenclature of the city. Smart and connected health. For us, that's robotic surgery. Uh, it's a lot of wearable devices, so smart watches are, are always a, a pretty big hit there because they are so popular and so already kind of ingrained as devices in where we are. Um, but they're also embedded systems, so things that are implantable devices that are completely inside your body. Um, that goes to that materials work I mentioned, but there's a whole host of issues there. And, uh, one of the things I'm going to show off here in a second revolves around that idea. And then autonomous systems, that's your driverless car, your unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, surface vessel in the water or underwater vessel. So we've sort of gravitated to those pillars. These can change though. We want to be an evergreen group that as technology sort of evolves, you know, these may not be the right pillars in three or four years. As they start to mature, or they grow or they change, we're going to find research opportunities in different spaces. And hence the sort of generic name Link Lab. Um, people always ask me why Link Lab. I have no idea. I honestly think they named it that. So it is generic enough. So no matter what we research, we can always make up a reason why it's called Link Lab. Um, so that's that. But as far as who came together, so we have six different departments that have come together to, to form this research group. And again, it's just that idea that we want to pull out of that department-centric mentality. Um, all of these departments are extremely supportive of what they're doing. You know, they have their people coming over. They provide resources to the lab. So it's not an abandonment of that model at all. It's just what is the next extension, uh, extension of the department kind of focus. And like I said, we have 34 faculty, 200 grad students. And I always love this one. We always like to talk about how the space is designed to really generate ideas. We have whiteboards everywhere. We have almost 2,400 square feet of whiteboards. Um, shout out to my undergraduate help, Shai, who actually measured all of our whiteboards to help me get that together. I think one of the things when we talk about the environment, so the space itself, um, this is a big change for people. And there's a lot of studies coming out right now as industry goes to this open environment, um, and we really stress about how, oh, we want to drive collaboration. We want to drive innovation. And we'll do that by cramming everybody in this big open floor. What they're not really telling is that it's actually a big cost savings for companies. So when you see companies adopt this, they do it for, for some good reasons, but then some, some accounting reasons as well. So you have to be kind of cognizant of why we're adopting it in other areas. Um, you know, and I'll talk about what that means for us. But you know, we had, like I said, we have a big open kind of community space. Uh, the faculty offices, I did pick the one faculty member that has put greenery into his office and has decorated it really well, so they don't all look this nice, but there you go, that's Dan Quinn. Uh, the lab space and just some more examples of kind of the openness. What we've seen come about is, I don't, obviously faculty have spent a lot of time in here. Glass front offices, it opens up to the students, that's great. Lab space, we knew that would get used. Our biggest concern was what's happening here and what's happening here. And that's been one where over time, since January, we've seen this growth of people coming away from their desk and starting to utilize little booths and little tables that we have set up for just kind of dynamic, let's, let me meet with my team. Uh, let us talk about a new idea. Let's get on some of that 2,400 square foot of whiteboard to work something out. Within the first month, we had a group actually on the corner couches here. It was four different faculty, uh, from three different disciplines, two of whom didn't know each other prior to moving into Link Lab, working on a proposal together. And that is just, you know, this is in the first month. And it's like, okay, I know we're doing something right. When we're getting them out of their offices, and we're getting them into this space, and they're going to, to folks they did not know a month prior in a completely different discipline to start working on research. But more and more, we're hosting seminars, we're having talks. This space is filled up with, as we bring in students from those other schools, we have hoteling spots. So it's really, everything's designed around just generate ideas. Um, and when I talk about the pros and cons of this space, it's interesting because you'll see in the news a lot about how, oh, the open concept is actually killing innovation and it's driving people to be more private. And I think kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about what are the motivations of that? 
So you want to drive collaboration. Who do you have in your group? For us, it's a coalition of the willing. It's faculty that have elected to come join, that are bringing their graduate research students with them. So the students don't individually join. It is the, the faculty. But they're there because they want to work in a multidisciplinary nature. So all the motivations are lined up. But it still takes some interesting management uh, policies and some interesting social opportunities to drive people to talk and learn about each other, both professionally and personally. What it's not, or what I see in, in, in some of these studies are, oh, well, XYZ company built the whole new open environment. And they moved in their sales team and their HR team and their IT teams. And like, yeah, that's just not working. Well, well, yeah. Okay, think about that for a second. So HR, sensitive information, private conversations. You know a lot about everyone around you, and all of a sudden you stick them in the middle of everything in a big open environment. Sales, incredibly individually driven. Uh, I, I tried sales for about a year. I'm not good at that. Um, individually driven, super, super extroverted. So um, mix that with the IT crowd. You know, which they have to be heads down to keep everything running behind the background. And it's less about working with HR and more about working amongst themselves to make sure that the platforms they're supporting work. So where in that begs, oh, collaboration. But here, again, everyone here is, they are there to do multidisciplinary research. So you really see that differentiation and why we think this is working for us. And the students so far think it's working. Um, despite, and as good academics, they send me every paper that comes out that says open space is good or bad. Um, but, you know, that's why we think this experiment is working. And I think why the university wants to build on it. And then the second is just, we really want to emphasize some other aspects of the community. Um, and that's understanding the individual needs of our researchers. You know, so one of the big things that pops out is like, oh, well, if they're extroverted, they'll just kind of want to be in the space. And if they're introverted, we give them the option to move. Well, it's not quite that simple. Neither is the band of extrovert to introvert, right? But um, every student does have, you know, the choice to not be in the space if they would like. And we help find them other, uh, other space and they still have access to the lab for their work. But things like we really encourage personalization of the desks. And why that matters is because it creates another avenue for you to have a bond with the person around you. Some of these companies that try an open concept, they want it very sterile and very clean, so it looks uniform, it looks regimented. But it doesn't allow you to kind of extend your personality into your space, and a lot of times that's how you make contacts. Oh, you love Star Trek? I love Star Trek. Oh, you hike? I hike. And all of a sudden, you've created a relationship. None of that can come about as easily, especially if you're towards the introverted side, um, without having the opportunity. We drive a pretty extensive social calendar. We take advantage of diversity in the space. Um, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of focus on how do we get this group, which is our first official group picture, uh, to talk to each other. And so on the social side, we decided that the best way to get the students to talk amongst each other is have the students create a system to do that. So there's a student committee on culture and livability. That's kind of much. I wrote that on a whiteboard. For some reason, the horrible name stuck. But it's about number one, the students you know, have some feedback through that committee to us on how is the space working for you? What can we change just to make it more livable? The second side is socially, what can we do to have folks come together? So the residents, which is about 120, and then the rest of the group that's outside that we invite in, which is about another 100 or so, how can we bring them all together, both personally and professionally? So, so far, we've had two or three kind of speed dating events where people get to sit down and you sit down over pizza, maybe over a drink. We have the luxury of everybody being over 21. Um, but you sort of speed date about your work. You introduce your research and then they introduce theirs and then we pivot. Uh, we have board game nights. We had a, a big faculty versus student soccer game, which has led to my appointment later tonight at uh, UVA Imaging for an MRI on my knee, which is great. But we made a lot of relationships and that's what it's about. Um, so being active in that and having a student committee formed around that and resourcing those ideas are things that make this cohesiveness work. We didn't just jam everybody in the space and abandon them. Uh, we have this active collaboration going on and one of the big things to center on there is the diversity of the space. So on the right over here, I like to show this because we had uh, Senator Warner came and, and visited Link Lab and one of our students said, hey, it'd be amazing if we were welcome 
and every language represented it within the lab on this whiteboard to welcome the senator to the space. You can see what we ended up with. Um, I contributed the binary down here, so I, my tech nerd coming out, and then someone kind of one-upped me with hexadecimal at the bottom, but that's fine. Um, we have an extremely international diverse group. So a lot of our social events are celebrating holidays or celebrating events from other cultures or regions or religions. We had the first ever kind of officially organized um, Persian New Year celebration, which I just assumed with a pretty large crowd, especially there's a really tight Iranian community uh, who recently lost a student at UV Engineering, you may have seen in the news, but they all came together in the spring to celebrate the Persian New Year. And the whole Link Lab kind of banded around that. We had a gigantic group. And uh, the countdown was at like 12.32 in the afternoon. I, I didn't get a great explanation for when their New Year happens and why. I assume it's celestial in nature. But um, it's that kind of thing. And so when we had the, uh, the soccer event, we provided the main course, but every student brought a, a dish that was representative of their background. I brought cornbread. I'm a southerner. There you go. Um, a lot of it got eaten once they figured out what it was. I also provided honey butter, so that helps. Uh, but we had, you know, it, it's all that introduction that kind of brings it together that makes that collaboration work. And I think that's very unique to what we're trying to do is that there is so much focus on that for us. Um, let's see. And the other part is, and someone in the UV engineering grad, uh, grad student department really brought this out there today, but value proposition of your time at the university. So it's not just let me get an amazing graduate engineering degree, or let me make some new friends, or let me get some, some kind of worldly exposure about those around me. But as I was mentioning with the proximity of the schools, it's a lot about what is this going to look like in the real world? And so when we think about our research and we think about the work that these students are going to do uh, once they graduate, it's, it's never just about the technology anymore. And so again, it's not multidisciplinary around just their engineering, it's multidisciplinary into business, policy, education, commerce. So what we're doing is we have a whole educational series where we bring in a licensing and venture group, who may or may not be in attendance in the back, okay? Uh, this Friday, right? Coming in to uh, talk a little bit about um, what does intellectual property development mean at the university? You know, these graduate students are actually classified as employees. It creates a really interesting intellectual property arrangement between the students and the university. We help them with writing. There's a graduate writing student lab. We help them with presentation skills. Um, we go into classes on um, what are other job opportunities outside of traditional three, which is government, straight industry like a consulting world or back into academia. There's a lot of entrepreneurism. Uh, focus, which I think this crowd probably knows a lot about, but you know, there's opportunities for them to uh, have competitions, to pitch companies, to go and get mentorship into that, you know, that side of uh, not just developing the product, but how you develop the business, how do you find money, how do you find partners, how do you grow that. Those are all non-graduate engineering topics. We get into ethics, get into privacy, get into security. Uh, well, cybersecurity is kind of ingrained in the research, but just as an ethos, um, those are all things that we give opportunities for our students to, to come in and learn more about as well, in addition to their degree work. This Friday, uh, IEEE, so standards organization, is coming in. They're running a workshop to help students and faculty understand how you create a standard, in this case, around the ethics of autonomous cars. So um, how you want to regulate the development of those systems from an ethical standpoint. Uh, and, and you can show that, you know, governing bodies can create these standards. That's something that they don't, that's very different. That's tangential to their to research, but it's things we want them to see. So when we look back at those goals from the university about, you know, research and education and student life, that's really what we put a lot of focus on and why, despite being a tech group and research group, I started the first 30 minutes of talking through all this. Because this is just as much an experiment for the students in the university as the actual experiments we're conducting. So transition them to the tech side, and this is where I have to be careful because I can spend hours on this slide. Um, but the point being is kind of how did we get here to what we're calling cyber physical systems? And so the easiest way for me to explain what that is is just think of an autonomous car. It has sensors that see the world. It has computing on board where it pulls that data in, decides based on all these different criteria that have been programmed into it, 
and its perception of the environment around it, it makes a decision. And that decision immediately feeds back into a physical control and it drives the car. That's a cyber physical system where you read the world, you compute, and then you have some effect on the world. So sensor to effector. Um, being able to do all that in a continuous loop is new. And that's why this, well not new, uh, it's been around for a while. But there have been a lot of efficiencies and a lot of uh, kind of rigorous research behind uh, what it will take for that to become an everyday item instead of just a research, a benchtop item. Uh, of, of why we're kind of in this fourth industrial revolution. You know, so you, you see across the timeline here, the first industrial revolution kind of in the transition through 1800, uh, really about mechanization of processes and applying power to things. So water power and creating steam power and applying that to a process. The second industrial revolution, um, now how do we go from build a few to build many? And one of the big things that happened there, electrical energy. And what that allowed you to do was have all these processes and have this mechanization, but it doesn't have to be located on top of your energy production. So you don't have to have a water wheel that is automatically where some of your uh, textile industry is. You don't have to have a huge steam-driven engine right beside where you want to run uh, an assembly line. So that separation, uh, the, the de-regionalization of the, the uh, power plant really is what pushed through that phase. And then into the Industrial Revolution where, so here we're kind of using, a person goes to a tool and uses it to achieve something, but here we actually just go to the tool and program it so it does the work. And that's sort of the third Industrial Revolution is uh, introducing everything digital. Uh, being able to program and reprogram a machine to do a task. Uh, being able to go to these machines from a data standpoint instead of a physical kind of hands-on work uh, standpoint. And then into the fourth, which is cyber physical systems, kind of the Internet of Things, what happens there, and the reason I, I love this slide is because the way it's embodied right here. So you, you kind of have the computer and the machine all in one. I understand it's sort of gray, can't really see it, but the significance of these being four separate entities that are all communicating. So it's again, it's that disconnect. You're no longer tied to your control box, to your power plant, um, to your sensor, to where the work is being done. It can all be separate. So all of a sudden these systems can just look like anything we need them to look like. For an autonomous car, we package it up, it looks like a car. And to industrial systems, you have sensors miles, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away that affect an operation uh, at that distance. And so, Underlying all of this are just how you power things and how you communicate with things. And so that's been a major driver and the availability of labor, which is where I, I can get sidetracked, but we won't today. Um, another thing I love about this slide is there on the right-hand side, when we talk about degree of complexity. Um, complexity is the whole reason multidisciplinary research is happening. So as these systems get more complex, and I mean complex, not as in complicated, um, as in complex, because they're not true synonyms. Complexity is why cyber physical systems exist and why this research is happening. Because these problems have gotten outside of the bounds of a person can just look at the entire scope of the problem and understand it. You're talking about massive amounts of data generation. You're talking about massively complicated and complex um, interactions between these digital devices and the physical world that it, it can't just be reasoned by an individual or group of individuals. So it takes gigantic systems. It takes data analytics. This is where big data came from. Just a couple interesting stats you've probably seen in articles and such, but um, as I mentioned earlier, the number of connected devices is projected to go past a trillion in about 2035. A trillion. Um, 90% of the data in the world was generated in the last two years. So that's before the massive explosion of a trillion devices that are collecting all that data. But 90% in the past two years. That comes out to about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data a day. It's a lot. Just to put it in a little more kind of real world perspective, there's 3.5 billion Google searches a day. 3.5 billion. 
So we're not even 8 billion people, but there's 3.5 billion searches a day. I'm probably a significant chunk of that. Um, every minute, the Weather Channel gets over 18 million forecast requests. Venmo or PayPal, if, you're, if you haven't gotten to Venmo yet. $52,000 every minute. Spotify, 13 new songs every minute. Uber rides, 46,000 trips every minute. 600 new page edits to Wikipedia every minute. So when we talk about how you handle that, you think about back to what a cyber physical system is. You understand what's happening in the world, you digitize that. You analyze that, you make a decision off of that, and you act on that all in one loop. So you're connecting that capture to the action. And there, there can be a human in a loop, but often not. Both definitions work for cyber physical system. That's a lot. So that's that degree of complexity. Um, that's why it both cyber physical systems are kind of enabling everything that's happening, but they're also sort of a requirement because it is so different um, from, from how we've done things prior. So kind of back to Link Lab finally. So our research, smart cities, smart health, autonomous systems. Um, these pictures are all from the lab. I just think it's kind of fun. The same uh, Dan Quinn that had the beautiful office with all the plants. He also built a little city out of old circuit boards on his wall, so we had to capture that. That was fun. This is our surgical robot. Um, that is the game operation underneath the surgical robot. That is my one thing that I've contributed to Link Lab so far that I will take credit for. It says, hey, it'd be really cool if the surgical robot could demo on the operation game. That's the one where you use little tweezers to pull out the body parts and it buzzes you. As soon as we found out that that buzz wasn't going to short out the robot, it's really fun to play with. Um, and then autonomous systems. So that's uh, one of our cars and I actually brought it today. Uh, and I'll talk about that because that's pretty key to uh, or representative of, of a lot of our work. You don't have to read all this. Um, the attempt for me was just to put everything we do or close to everything we do on one slide. But the, the one words I want to bring out of that, the volume, the variety, and the velocity of data. So how much of it, how different it is, and, and by velocity, I mean how, how you need to interact with that. Is it something where I need a decision now? Is it something where, oh, I just want to report in a week? Or is it something where I'm doing annual economic you know, numbers off of? But that matters drastically to how you handle that. So everything when you think about smart cities, traffic data, are you trying to operate the, switch, the, the traffic switches real time? Or do you just want to know where to pave the next road? That velocity difference in that data, the speed with which you're going to, to use that data, really, really, really drives everything how you design a system and what you're doing there. Um, this is also the space that really just does encompass that internet of things. Uh, this is what will drive the trillion of endpoints. Trillion of physical endpoints. One thing I always love is people say, do you do cybersecurity for internet of things? Absolutely. My next question is, we should probably think about physical security. There's a trillion physical endpoints into the internet. That's scary. If you think about how much goes into you password protecting your computer, not letting anybody get to your phone, and face ID and fingerprint, and password and dual authentication, please everyone always dual authenticate everything you, you possibly can. But now every center is gonna be an avenue into the internet. Something to definitely think about for the cyber and the physical side. Um, for smart cities, you know, I mentioned that the city is a little bit of a misnomer here. So we have groups that go everything from the natural environment to the built environment. So uh, notably, we're down uh, in Virginia Beach and we help work with coastal flooding down there. Um, somewhat, you know, timely given uh, the hurricane that recently came through. But it's interesting how just to do things like flood depth can be really oddly complicated and complex. It's not just about, oh, how deep is the water? But oh, by the way, when you're six feet underwater, you tend to not have power or communications. So if you want that velocity of the data to be a real-time decision, you have to build a sensor network that can operate in that environment. And that's difficult, and that's, what a cyber, that's why the cyber physical system side of that is so important. The system design of that, how you power that thing, how much computation you do at the sensor versus letting it go back. The more you compute here, maybe the less data you have to transmit back. 
Um, again, communications. What do you use to get that data back that you're not interfering with something that could be more important? Um, so this group that works down at the coast, they built these sensors and they had them mounted um, uh, in a couple of towns and, and they worked so well that the towns actually promptly gave them back because they're gonna go and actually bid out a full commercial system. But the physics of just telling how deep the water is, is just an acoustic sensor. It's just, oh, sound wave, boom, floor back. Okay, I know the floor is six feet away. Flood waters, oh, all of a sudden there's a floor two feet away. Okay, do some math, four feet of flooding. But that wasn't the hard problem. That wasn't the cyber physical system problem. The rest of it was, was really hard, really difficult, but the group did a great job on it. Um, and it. And it led to real impact. Traffic is always just a really big one. Everything like I said from controlling uh, the minute to minute, second by second flow of traffic to designing traffic systems to thinking about all these alternative modes of transportation. We'll see when I talk a little bit in the aut autonomous systems section about um, having different types of roads for autonomous vehicles versus people. And really, if it's all people driven, we know how to handle that. If it was all autonomous, we know pretty much what that could look like. But man, that in between, where it's us and them, that's gonna be messy. Oh, and then put scooters and bikes and a lot of cabs and the regular public transportation system and all that all in one grid that is a little hard to change because it is so uh, built in. And, uh, and you're talking about change cycles of 20, 30 years. Technology's moving a little faster than that. So that's one really interesting area where your ability to analyze greatly outpaces your ability to actually act um, in many ways. You can't just rip up all the roads and redesign them. So you have to think about that iterative response um, so traffic's always a fun one. Some, some other little interesting projects, visible light communications. So instead of Wi-Fi, being able to use a light bulb to transmit both power and data. Um, we have a group working on that. You know, I came from the government where you can't just broadcast Wi-Fi in a couple uh, office buildings here and there. Things like Li-Fi communications are something a little more secure. Um, they have a, a ton of application. Uh, I just came back from a conference uh, where I saw people trying to power things with, with uh, light beams, which was really interesting. Not like lasers into space for space probes kind of, but more localized Internet of Things powering. Um, the dynamics of electric fleets. All of a sudden, you know, we talk about regionalization. So in your car, your car looks like it does because it has to create its own energy on demand within the car. But when they become electric, you get outside that. You can pull electricity from anywhere. But then you have really, really interesting dynamic transportation problems of distance and time and charge. Um, and so the entire structure of highway systems and towns, uh, you know, towns pop up because that's your way station. That's your gas station. What happens when all those distances change and the frequency changes? So you're talking about complete restructuring and redesign of how far towns are apart, how far rest stops are apart, where you need charging, why you need charging, how fast it charges, is there a priority order, how much it costs, where does energy come from? Uh, so those are kind of uh, some other interesting things that we're looking at. And then also just because of the, the trillions of devices, that's, that's a trillion batteries. That's a lot. When I was with Homeland Security, we had sensors all on the southern border. And we saw where you had border agents that were trained border agents that just became professional battery changers. They would spend a significant chunk of their time, more than half of their time, just quite literally going to Walmart, buying a bunch of batteries, and they're just driving through the desert, changing out batteries on sensors. Now multiply that to a trillion. That's not, it's not possible. So we have a group that's working on super low powered integrated chips. So they just draw less power. Or you go back to the light. Maybe we can pull in power from different ways. Um, but when you multiply things by a trillion, it all becomes really interesting problems. Let's go. So smart health. This is really interesting because when you start to involve people and disease, um, it's not just about how you treat a disease. It's a lot about how you communicate to the person you know, what they need to know and how they need to know it. The military does this a lot. How do you give just the right amount of information to an operator where it's actionable and it's pertinent, but it's not too much, it's not distracting? 
I mean, how many of us have been like, oh, I, I really need to go to the doctor for like a year or two now. Oh, I haven't been to the dentist in forever. Is it going to matter if just a smartwatch is just telling you to do that every month? Probably not. So not only is it about reading the body and understanding new ways to tell if there's something going on, but there's a whole science behind how you actually make an informed ping to the person so that they act on it. Because all that's useless if they get it and they're like, just going to swipe that notification that I'm having a heart attack. Who cares? Don't have time right now. It's a really interesting problem. I mean, that's a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of science. Just something that someone can just swipe left on. And then it just all just goes away. So a lot of what we're doing at Link Lab is that kind of interface into the person and into society to make sure that, oh, if we have devices that can detect an asthma attack ahead of time, that can start to alert you towards dementia. Dementia is a hard one because there's a lot of just acceptance and denial in that field. And I don't mean denial with all the negative connotation. I mean, in the strict definition of like, you know, it's really hard to just self-diagnose and self-realize when it's something so profound and, and currently somewhat untreatable. Uh, depression is another one. Uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiac, all with their different factors around just the patient acceptance. You know, there's this kind of, in U.S. healthcare, it's, you, you should own your own healthcare. Well, that's great. But are we all going to prioritize it the right way? And how does each person need to be communicated to to make sure that you're making the right health decisions? So it is about understanding. It's also about communication. I'm going to kill your camera pan here. Um, one of the really cool things we're doing when we talk about multidisciplinary research. So this is the top of the respiratory system. It's a 3D printed trachea. This is a little sensor. Uh, it's a piezoelectric sensor, which it's, a, it's an energy harvester. So as you move this up and down, that mechanical energy gets transferred into electrical energy uh, to help you generate power. Originally, a group came together of electrical engineers with some biomedical folks and said, hey, it'd be really cool if we could put a sensor in the respiratory system. And just looking at what that sensor is giving us can we predict an asthma attack? Okay, that's really useful. Because most people that have those severe onset asthma attacks have their puffers with them. If they knew ahead of time, get themselves somewhere comfortable, slow down a bit, get some water and start puffing. But then, of course, because we're engineers, we've got to complicate it, right? Like, oh, what if? And here comes the mechanical engineers. What if this thing also powered a device? So what if the sensor that you want to put inside the body to monitor respiratory system, what if it, what if it powered itself too? So now what they're looking at is you insert this into your respiratory system, same material as you breathe in and out can now create the energy for that sensor that is completely inside your body. So you don't have to go through surgery to replace a battery. You don't have wires coming out uh, to, and have a battery pack on your belt loop. It can be completely inside the body. Shout out to my multifunctional materials integration friends. You can do that, but boy, the body doesn't really like metal. So got to figure that out, but that's fine. They're, they're doing a lot of good work. So yeah, all of a sudden it's, what if our respiratory system could power all of this? Oh, but, but if it's an asthma attack, how much are we stressing the respiratory system? Because hey, it's energy, conservation of energy, right? If you're creating energy, you're, take, you're making this work a little harder. How much is that harder? Does that, does that impact asthma? Um, but really interesting problem. So now there's five different disciplines of engineers and medical practitioners working on this problem of energy harvesting inside the human body for the sake of powering these little devices. There's a great article, I think, in UVA Today written up about it recently. But it does invite so many different things of, you know, um, insurance, right, policy, prices, treatment. So who gets all this data? You're generating data. This is that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Um, what do you as a person do with that data? What if you give permission to people to look at that data for research? Um, every single person starts generating data with that. So it's not only about, it started with, hey, we want to detect asthma. Hey, then can we power ourselves? And then, oh, that same thing, you can power and the data coming out that tells you how good the asthma is doing, but, but that's a lot of data. And do you, do you have the full computer inside of you? Do you pump it out somewhere? Does a third party? crank on that? Does the hospital crank on that? Um, 
So again, so many different problems. I mean, just the fact that you can breathe in and out and, and power device in your body is cool, but the scope of the problem is, is huge. And that's why the opportunity is so much fun. Uh, another really big one is robotic surgery. So the origin of our picture here. Um, that's one where milliseconds of communication matters. And coordination, you know, the big one is, oh, someone on the East Coast can get operated on by someone on the West Coast. Well, that's fine, but what if there's a little bit of a delay and some of the surgeons on the East and some are on the West and there's a delay between their controls? When you have an, an error in the system, what, whose fault was that? How do you find that out? You know, right now with these systems, uh, the Da Vinci, which is the most, uh, I think it's maybe the only, I should check that, FDA approved surgical robot used all the time. Um, has anyone actually had surgery with the Da Vinci? Typically in some of my bigger rooms, people have, but um, it doesn't provide a lot of haptic feedback. So when you're controlling it and you bump into something, it doesn't tell you. You just kind of have to know. But luckily, the majority of the operators with these systems are very ex experienced surgeons. So they just kind of know. It's like you know your way around your kitchen because you cook a few meals a day there. You just kind of know. Same thing. Well, what happens when you have a new surgeon and the robot can't compensate for that lack of experience because it doesn't have that feedback? Do you educate the surgeon differently? Do you design the robot differently? Both, neither. Those are all the kind of problems when you talk about systems to systems approach. Uh, and, the, and the robotic surgery is a really interesting um, example there of it's super simple to make a robot to do something. It's also simple to educate a medical practitioner into what they should be doing. And I use that very loosely. Uh, when they start interacting and they're dependent upon each other and there's, there's lives at stake, there's large amounts of money at stake, um, you're getting some pretty big problems. So that systems to systems interaction is, is something that we focus on at Link Lab. Uh, the last one I'll talk a little bit about is just health in the home. Um, and that's a little bit of what I was talking about earlier, just the idea that we, we want to have these sensors in your home so we can, you know, a doctor can just look at your heart no matter where you are. But again, there's just so many other questions that aren't technology based that make that a really interesting problem. Um, but also just drives up the price of being alive. You know, so at one point do the economics of all this, like we can do it, doesn't mean we should. Uh, you know, we're at that interesting point in medicine where treatments are starting to get to the point where you have to kind of ask that economic question of, okay, at what point do you get denied because it just is routinely, not on an individual basis, but on a policy basis, it's just too expensive. And I know a lot of decisions get made that way in insurance, but it's really, it's just compounding every day because of that kind of combinatorial science and tech thing. Autonomous cars, they're super fun. Um, I don't usually take too long on this one other than to say, we really like to think about not only how we're gonna do research, but how we're gonna educate. So the research that we do into autonomous cars, it's not about the learned model of, oh, I can pump in a lot of data into my machine learning algorithm and teach this car how to drive. But what happens when it runs into something that it doesn't understand? I think my next... Oh, don't care about you, there it is. Um, I love this slide. So this is a machine learning algorithm that's trying to classify stuff so it knows where to go and what to do. Left side, oh, I see a car. I'm a car, hey, you're a car. I know how to interact, that's super easy. Right side, you're a car with a little bike and another bike and a bigger bike and a person. It's, there's no way you can train a system to classify all those objects and know what's really going on. Well, that's not true. Currently, that's very hard to do. So a lot of the research that Link Lab is doing is saying, okay, let's not just rely on that learned model. How do we teach the car essentially some common sense? So no matter what it's seeing, if it can't classify what's going on, that's okay. Because it still knows generally, hey, I'm on a road. There's some rules of the road. There's some general best practices of driving. And then the key is, oh, and I know what I can do as a car. What this faculty member in particular does, uh, he loves Formula One racing. He loves it because it's pushing those cars to the, just to the brink of just disaster. If you look at Formula One in slow motion, when they go around a turn, they're sliding just a little bit. Just look, one mile per hour faster, they're out of control. One mile per hour less, they lose the race. 
So he's bringing that same concept to here. It's just teach the car what can the car, how does a car know what it can do? So if it needs to get out of the way of something, it knows how fast it can go, how sharp it can turn, where it can go based on the rules of the road. Sort of that whole trolley problem that you always hear about. If, you know, if it's the runaway trolley and do you hit the trolley or the people on the sidewalk or that kind of question. But really be able to teach the car some common sense about these edge cases, things that you could drive a billion miles and you're never going to see three tiny bikes and a half person on a Bosch car and know what to do. Four way stop with some ducks and an ambulance and three of you got to the intersection at the same time. Like none of us are navigating that correctly. There's no machine that navigates that correctly. But it's those kind of things that we want to kind of teach the car to do. Like that's going to not be a learned model. That's going to be something that is going to be more inherent to the ability of the car. Um, a lot of the other things we do in this space research wise are kind of look at the combination of different autonomous vehicles. So um, what happens when you have a flyer with a ground or a ground with an underwater and how do they interact? It's, it's a little simpler when you want to have a, a fleet or a swarm of all similar ground vehicles. But what happens when they're of different types, different varieties. You have a freight truck with two kind of trailer cars that are just regular cars. You have you know, a flyer following a ground vehicle. So there's a lot of those interplays. But kind of back to the point here was the educational side. So this is the car you saw in the picture. It's a one-tenth scale autonomous car. We call it F110 because it's that Formula One racing, but at one-tenth scale. Uh, LiDAR sensor on front. I've got a cool video to kind of show about that, even though I think we're running out of time. Um, computation on board, this thing operates like a autonomous car, drives itself. So we do a lot of research with this, but we teach a class with this. There's an undergraduate class, fourth year, maybe third year, agnostic to your discipline. You can join. You get in teams of four. The first thing you do is you learn to program basic autonomy with the little turtle on a program on your screen. And then for some reason, we hop you straight to a 30 mile per hour car platform. They learn to build this. They learn to connect all the devices, and then they learn to program it. And the final exam is not a written test, it's a race. And we have a racetrack set up in Link Lab, and they just do a time trial. I think the last time in the spring, they got something like four minutes, maybe it was eight, to do laps, and your fastest time is your grade. Not, not, not the only thing. You can explain your way out of a bad time. We had eight teams, seven cars established times. One car didn't went straight through the end of the track, pushed our little cushion barrier all the way across the link lab. Um, very aggressively, it was hilarious. Um, but they still got a pretty good grade because they were able to show that, hey, we tweaked the car so much towards that fast time that we just crossed the barrier of it couldn't sense fast enough to turn given the speed that it was going. But they were able to show that in the code, so they still got like probably a B or something. But, but the point being that Back to the complexity thing, we need to start thinking about, we can't teach based on disciplines and then toss people out into the world knowing that the technology looks like this. You know, when I went through my graduate degree and my undergraduate, I would have had an undergraduate class on sensing or computing or communications or just mechanical, the design of the car itself. There wasn't a class that says, hey, we should teach you based on what it looks like because this is what it looks like in the real world, so why don't we just teach that? Um, and that's something that is really getting embodied in UVA engineering um, and that Link Lab has been able to exercise a bit. You know, we're working on curriculum for PhD level, master's level, undergraduate level, but this is why, because we want to teach to systems like they look in the real world, just like we want to research systems like they look in the real world. Um, and that's a great example of that. It's one o'clock, all right, so. The only other thing I'll just say, um, business model for the lab, you know, we got started out because we uh, were part of the strategic, strategic Initiative Fund at the university, SIF, where they put forth a lot of money to different ideas because, you know, a lot of resources are hard to come about if you go department to department to say, hey, here's, here's my hat, can you put some money in, I want to try this crazy thing. But strategically, the, the university wanted to do that. So we started out with SIF funds, generous contributions from all the departments that help us with support and funds. But our business model in the end is gonna come from um, partnerships with, with industry and grants that we get from the government. 
So we have an interesting affiliates program where typically a university relationship is really central around recruitment. For us, recruitment's still very important for our grad students, but it's more about kind of this. We want our grad students researching things that are grounded in real world problems. So our first affiliate was Lidos. Um, Lidos came to us and said, hey, we have this really cool autonomous surface ship so ignore that there's a cabin on this, because it doesn't really need that, this is in test mode, uh, that they're working for the Navy. And this, uh, you can go find this, um, it's called Sea Hunter. We have a lot of autonomy problems with that. How does it get through different environments where it's interacting with interesting coastal topographies, interesting weather, other vehicles? How does it go about its mission in an efficient manner? So they came in and became our first affiliate. And they did a, a half day brief on here's everything we know about the problem. And then they started funding our students and funding our research. So we have groups that do autonomous systems work and that's what they're helping research. And that's really, again, what we want to do. It's grounded in real world stuff. You know, so it's the complexity of the problem drives you away from that academic department focus. Still very important, don't get me wrong. It's, I'm in no way saying that that's not appropriate, it absolutely is. But there needs to be also entities that address that multidisciplinary side and grounded in real world problems is what we're trying to achieve. I think that's basically it. I have a couple of videos, but those can wait. Um, any questions? I kind of went through a whole <laughs> phase of stuff because this is basically a startup at the university. So there's those organization, the business, the research side. Yeah. yeah. Sensors fail, <coughs> fail, systems fail. What fail-safe systems are you looking into? Yes, so um, uh, the question was, you know, given all those great numbers I'm throwing out about how many sensors are out there in the systems of systems, um, when you come to failure. Whew, so I could have a systems faculty member come and talk about that, but basically it's a calculation into the whole thing. It's not that you're absolutely trying to avoid failure. You know what's going to happen. It's can you kind of have an idea of how often you fail? How much do you have to have you know, a repeat of what you're trying to do? Um, or do you just build into the system knowing I'm going to throw 1,000 sensors out there. I only need 200 to work because I modeled that out. So in answer to your question, it's a little bit of just understanding what we are trying to achieve and work backwards. So we don't need the individual sensor or a system to be fail safe per se. Um, we just need to make sure that as we design these things that we understand what that failure rate is and how it impacts the answer we're trying to get out or the action we're trying to get out of the system and design appropriately. And a lot of times it is make it fail safe. Um, that can be a software issue, it can be a hardware issue. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big field. And it's an entire field. Systems, a whole subfield of that is failure, so. Um, but it's just something where it's not always just about we, we have to make it where it doesn't fail. You know it's going to, you can plan for it, you can design appropriately. Yeah. How, how the business model butts up against the educational mission of the School of Engineering. Um, if the educational, if the problems are being driven by LIDOS, does that impact publication, um, anything like that for the students? Right. So uh, the question was just, you know, given the business model, um, and to add to it, we are trying to treat ourselves like a startup. So when we look at our finances, we, it's like, <laughs> this is our burn rate every month, and this is how much ramp we have until we're out of money. Uh, now, I'm really hoping if we just ran out of money, the university would be like, well, that's, all right, bye. Um, but, you know, we are kind of coming into that economics of the department of the educational system. Um, to the last part of your question about when Lidos drives research, how do you do things like publish? We just mandate that everything we work on you can put papers out on. Now sometimes they'll say certain aspects of the work maybe not there, and that's more of a handshake agreement, but almost everything we've, yeah, everything, I can say every, everything we've done has been a we will publish off of this agreement. We don't do classified work, uh, and where we do company proprietary stuff, it is minimal, and it's mostly given as like context to the problem. Like we learned a lot about that Sea Hunter thing that we aren't researching. It was just, just so they can kind of give us the context. 
So we are trying to maintain that academic flavor. Um, but you just want that problem to have some impact. You want to, you know, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a balance. And then how it plays into the business side on the education is, uh, you know, if we, as in Link Lab, wants to start offering a cyber physical system master's or cyber physical systems PhD, you could, in theory, be taking students from one of the departments. And, you know, they get a good amount of money from that. So the, the theory, because the departments are on board with this, knowing that, is that you know, we're going to grow the pie. So it's not dividing the pie into smaller pieces for everybody. It's we should, by offering things like this, attract a lot more attention. So while everyone's percentages go down, their raw numbers should go up. But it's a concern. I mean, it's something we're keeping eyes on. And, you know, we don't want to cannibalize ourselves to do these. And that's why that SIF, that pocket of money to start out, was so important. So we have a little bit of a safety net, and we have some runway to get it figured out before we're truly impacting the departments on a day-to-day -day kind of thing. But, I mean, again, those the departments I put up there, every department chair is, is on board with what we're doing, and all of them have contributed in some way. Um, and it's been a coalition of the willing is, like, the best way to talk about it. They've all been great. So, yeah. And actually, an entry to that point, um, there's a director for cross-cut initiatives within the School of Engineering. His name's John Locke. He's a professor. He left a department chair position to do that. So if you want to kind of have a, an idea of the importance of what we're trying to do, he left as a department chair and created this position for himself, the director of cross-cut initiatives, to help guide that. Um, you know, and department chair is not something you just kind of walk away from that easy. So. Uh, it is really important. We really do think that this model is going to be maybe not the model for the future, but this is going to inform it. And we also get to cheat a little bit because Jack Stankovic, our director of the lab, our faculty director, he quite literally wrote the report on cyber physical systems education. Uh, a few years ago, National Academy of Sciences had a big report on how you're going to educate the next generation of engineers to tackle these kind of systems, and he was a co-chair for the report, and he's the uh, director for our for our group, so that helps. Yeah. What kind of interaction do you have with undergrads? Uh, ah, yes, yeah. so undergrads. Um, so like I mentioned, though that 220 students, all graduate. Undergrads. Um, one is they organically find themselves in the research groups as undergraduate researchers, which is nice. Our, um, and then through classes, through offerings like this as the beginning. Now that we're in place since January, we're starting to look at opportunities to do uh, capstones, senior design projects, however you want to call them. Uh, at UVA, they're capstones, where we're not going to mess with the curriculum, but um, when they go to do that capstone, it can be a multidisciplinary type capstone. And there is a program now called the Technology Leadership Program, TLP, and they do a design integration capstone that's very similar. So we might sort of morph that or add to it in some way, um, but to have that capstone experience when you build something as undergrad, be multidisciplinary is the first step. And then we did get a little exploratory grant to say what would a minor look like in CPS? How do you pull someone that's educated in one aspect, in computing, in the mechanical side, and sensing and comms, and pull them into a minor of the whole system? That's hard. We spent a lot of the summer talking about that. Um, I was on board just to help with the, 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 the financial model side. A good group of our faculty went at that and tried to think, well, what would that curriculum look like? So there's some ideas on the table. Um, I do still kind of think that at the undergraduate level, the foundation in a discipline is very important. So, um, yeah, TBD, but we're trying some stuff. Yeah. Hi, now that Link Lab's been up and running for almost a year, right? Are there any aspects you've found that you'd like to tweak or change in the space or the program? All right, everybody, get a second sandwich. Yeah. Uh, the question is, now that we're almost a year old, what would you change, essentially? Um, well, one was that growth problem. You know, so the whole idea was let's co-locate. And then out of the 220, we have half of those that we've actually co-located. So that was one. It's just there wasn't a really good kind of survey on, hey, who would hypothetically join if we did this? Um, so correcting that for sure. And I think the other one is, you know, I talked a little bit about the dynamics of space and, and and each individual's need for privacy and inclusion, but also collaboration. Um, you could design the space to be on a spectrum of private to open and collaborative. 
We do have a lot of spaces where you can go and get a desk that's a little more uh, kind of away from stuff and, and quieter. You can go grab a team room. There's booths where you can kind of get in and have a little more, you know, um, seclusion. But I think some, you know, we went all the way towards the open collaboration. I think we can nudge that back a bit for sure. Um, I had another good one in mind. Oh, and um, the other one is just um, trying to think about the research space, the, the side of everything. So we have that little bit of lab space. Um, again, I think we, we probably didn't do ourselves justice in just how much people would take advantage of an open bench top with some community tools. I mean, you see those maker spaces pop up everywhere. Um, we, we could have used a lot more. Absolutely. And then actually on the social side, one thing that we, we lack that I, I, I wish we could go back and do as well is a family room. I mean, we're talking about grad students, you know, so they're well into their adult lives. Uh, we have people with kids. We have people that are about to have a kid. Um, we have a lot of, as I said, international crowds. So to have a room that can be utilized for if you need to feed a child, you need to pump. Um, if you need to go observe prayer in the middle of the day, something just to go and you know have that solitude, that would have been something as well. We have a little thing that we call kind of the phone booth. Uh, this we can go for phone conversation. It's morphed into people try to kind of do prayer in it, and it's tiny. Um, that would have been one as well. Kind of understanding, we could have gone a touch more towards the making people comfortable in the space and having a home for every need. Um, could have come back a little bit on the spectrum of pure open versus private for sure and then just size man we could use we could use all of Olson Hall I don't think they're going to let us do that though so yeah okay all right thank you um I do have cards we have a website would love just to have everyone involved come by and see the space um, we're there and uh, we have a staff of two so one of us can always give a tour and walk you around uh, but it, you know generally we want to be ingrained with the community and that's at the local level the state level everything so please come by and or just keep in touch okay thank you